uh, having different people from this congregation, you know, why they choose to support uh, this faith family. And we just ask that you prayerfully consider how you can support the congregation by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and indicate that in that um, uh, commitment covenant. We'll be passing, like you can either place it in the uh, plate that's going by, or we also have a receptacle um, for that uh, during our closing hymn. Um, a couple comments. First of all, my, my one thing, I wanted to say thank you to the women, the, the women's chorus, for that beautiful song. Um, uh, I, we are climbing Jacob's ladder. And whenever I hear that song, uh, we all, you know, our minds will drift to where that's most memorable to you. And my most memorable happened about 10 years ago. Um, my dad, who's right down front, uh, my dad had had neck surgery uh, where he, he had lost, a, he had a, a pinched uh, vertebrae. He lost functions in his like leg and arm. And so the doctor went in, did a great job, was able to kind of help heal him, uh, you know, release the pressure on his neck. And um, they gave him exercises on what to do. And, you know, you're supposed to move your arms and move your legs. And so uh, I come up to visit him. I was up at uh, fifth floor on Altman in the neurosurgery area. And, uh, you know, he found out what his number is in his room. And I knew exactly where he was because uh, you could hear somebody singing um, uh, in his room. He's singing, we are climbing Jacob's ladder. It's one of my favorite stories of my dad. Uh, and he's moving his arms like this, and he's climbing Jacob's ladder, and he's singing. And, uh, you know, I, it's like, I know where Dad is. So uh, there he was in that room. So anyway, thank you for that, uh, um, that. The other thing that captured my attention, the video, uh, I don't know about y'all, but last year we had a great Christmas Eve in that it was out in the parking lot with a pouring down snow. It was like a blizzard, okay? And it was phenomenal. But I really hunger and yearn for the opportunity to do candlelight here in this space. And there was a picture of the candlelight service, you know. I'm like, I I'm, can't wait till December 24th. We'll be able to do that. Now, December 23rd, we are going to offer, because some people really liked the outdoor service, so we are going to do that on December 23rd. So if you don't want to be in the space, and it's only a half hour, if you only want a half hour, come on December 23rd. Uh, if you want the full bar, candle lights, hymns, the whole nine yards, the, the boring message from the pastor... <laughs> Come to December 24th. So anyway, that, that's my pitch. Okay, enough of that. Uh, we are in the, uh, we're kind of winding down a series, uh, Story Under Construction. We've been looking at 10 different people uh, within the Bible as they really felt a tug from God and began to respond to that tug to follow what God's directive was uh, in their life. Now, these 10 people in our Bible, they had doubts, they had lots of questions, and plenty of failures. And yet, uh, because they followed uh, that God and that direction, that they were able to experience the peace, the power, the provision uh, of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So, the intent of this series is not just to give you some nice Bible stories to kind of file away in your recess. Instead, it, it's really to act as a springboard for all of us to reflect how God has kind of placed a tug on our lives. Because all of you are here for a reason. I mean, there's a lot of better things you could be doing on a Sunday morning. I'm sorry than listening to me, okay? Or, well, the choir's great, so maybe that's worth it. But there's plenty of other things you could be doing. But you've made a decision to glorify God in our music and in this time to give to, uh, of worship of our God. And what our hope is that these stories will kind of spark with you about how you can be a witness to others, <laughs> of why you have hope. Why do you place your trust in this Lord by where we worship 
uh, each Sunday. And, and that's kind of the goal so that you can be able to reflect on what is your witness. Because here is this truth. In many respects, you're going to be the only Bible that people read. Your life is the only Bible that people are going to read. Okay, And how you uh, reflect mercy, grace, generosity, compassion, all the qualities of Jesus Christ, all of that is going to be vital in passing on the torch uh, of faith. So today we're going to come up to a man by the name of Nehemiah. Nehemiah lived about uh, 600 years before Christ. Now, last week we talked about Isaiah. Uh, That was about 100 more years. So in the 700s was, 700 BC uh, was Isaiah. Now kind of come up to 600 years uh, to uh, the time of the prophet Jeremiah. This was a tumultuous time. This was a time when uh, the, the big kingdom of Babylon was looming from the north, and at the same time, his, uh, Jeremiah's country of Judah, which is where Jerusalem was located, it was really kind of falling into corruption, injustice, sexual immorality, and idolatry. They were straying away from their worship of the Lord God. It was in that season, uh, about, as I mentioned, uh, nearly 600 years uh, before Christ was born, that uh, God appointed, chose, uh, formed a young boy, Nehemiah, uh, who uh, he uh, was kind of tasked to be a prophet, a mouthpiece for the Lord to God's people. And this would happen when he was quite young. That's what I want to turn to today. I would encourage you, you got these uh, nice pew Bibles uh, in front of you. Uh, You'll want to keep your finger on it because I'm going to be kind of going all over this today on uh, page number 603 uh, of your pew Bibles. I'm going to be reading, uh, we're going to start with just Nehemiah chapter 1, this is the beginning of Nehemiah, verses 4 through 10. Hear now the word of the Lord. Now, the word of the Lord came to me, being uh, Jeremiah, saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, ah, Lord God, Truly, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. But the Lord said to me, again, Jeremiah, Do not say, I am only a boy, but you shall go to all to whom I send, and you shall speak to whoever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you. Then the Lord put out his hand, he touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over the nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and to overcome, overthrow, to build and to plant. Friends, this is God's word for God's people. Let's pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth May the meditations of each of our hearts, Lord, let them be a prophet to you. For you alone are our rock. You are our salvation. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay, friends, have any of you ever been appointed to be a bearer of Bad news, difficult news. Uh, Perhaps maybe uh, your regional uh, supervisor has come uh, to you and asked you uh, that your department needs to lay off 40% of your department. And that has to be done by the end of the year. (laughs) 
And at that point, you realize these are people who you've been to company picnics with. These are people who've been the coaches of your kids' soccer teams. Uh, these are the people who you've interacted with now for years. And you have been tasked to basically tell them their services are no longer needed. You ever have to be the bearer of bad news? I mean, at that point, you have to take a deep breath. You have to stand up and you have to just share what has been conveyed to you. Or maybe, maybe uh, your sibling has called you and, and your sibling's been having some medical tests and things like that and they uh, have announced that they've been diagnosed with stage four cancer. That the uh, doctor has said they only have months to live. You're grieving for about your, your sibling. And yet your sibling says, I'm so sick. Uh, would you be able to go tell mom and dad uh, about my condition? Mom and dad are in an assisted living area. They've uh, uh, got both have dementia and uh, are in that stage of life. And about the last thing on planet Earth you want to do is go and tell your parents about your dying sibling. And instead, what you got to do, take a deep breath. You stand up tall, and you have to announce difficult news. Or maybe uh, you're into law enforcement, and that uh, you've been assigned to traffic patrol, and one day... Uh, you notice somebody weaving in and out, and it's late at night, and you're pretty confident that somebody's going too fast and too recklessly. So you light them up, you pull them over, you're going to issue a breathalyzer, you kind of know where this is going, and then you realize that that person you pulled over is somebody who lives down your block in your neighborhood and you have to realize that you're about to be the bearer of really bad news for that person as you issue them a DUI. <laughs> and what do you do? You take a deep breath, you stand up tall, and you are a messenger uh, of what needs to be said, the truth. Or <laughs> maybe you're a preacher, <laughs> And uh, it comes upon uh, this time in the congregational's life where it's really being torn up into various factions, mostly driven by the news of the day of 24-7, 365, that has polarized this group of believers, this group of believers who used to sing together, group of believers that used to be in Bible studies together, people who would go on mission trips together, and now they're in the different camp. There's this side, and there's that side, and there's anger, and there's division, and there's pain that's all happening. And you as a pastor, you got to speak a word of truth. That friends, your primary identity is not in a political camp, your primary identity belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet, the polarization is so deep, so far ending, that people are so angry that they will not be able to hear you. <laughs> you know, uh, I was reading a, uh, an account of that very scenario that happened uh, out west in church in Washington State. This was uh, reflected in an article in the Atlantic Monthly a couple weeks ago, uh, Pastor Scott Dudley. And, uh, you know, he reflected on some of the challenges of that. And he says, you know, uh, the, if the Bible doesn't challenge your politics, at least occasionally, you're not really paying attention to the Hebrew Scriptures or the New Testament. The reality, however, is that uh, a lot of people, especially in this era, will leave a church if their political views are ever challenged. And yet, in this journey, there come those moments when even as a pastor, you got to be the bearer of painful news. That, you know, your primary identity does not belong to your political camp or whatever uh, media that you're listening to 24-7, that instead your allegiance is much higher than that. Your allegiance belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ, who will turn your political views up side down. And when those moments come, what do you got to do? You got to take a deep breath. 
You got to stand up strong, and you got to be willing to deliver what God has placed in your heart. Well, today's scripture passage comes to us from Jeremiah. He wasn't a bullfrog, okay? Now, Jeremiah was a prophet, not a bullfrog. Uh, not a friend of mine. Um, uh, yeah, now, Jeremiah was a prophet. Uh, he lived about 600 years uh, prior to the birth of Jesus Christ. He lived in a painful and difficult time. The people, frankly, had gone off the rails. Uh, God had commanded obedience. Worship one God and one God only. Instead, they were having all kinds of idols. Uh, God told them that their body is a temple. Instead, their sexual perversity and their promiscuity was just rampant. All kinds of immorality sexually. You had leaders who God said to honor the poor and care for them, and instead they were uh, permitting or exhibiting injustice. Uh, That was the kind of environment that Jeremiah found himself in at a very young age. Uh, He was called to speak truth, to be the bearer of bad news. Um, And... You know, Jeremiah wrote, I mean, there's a large, he, his career spanned about 40 years, okay? Long prophet. Now I wrote all of Jeremiah in the Bible. Also wrote the book of Lamentation. Long. What Jeremiah known for? I mean, almost kind of this doleful, this woeful kind of uh, preacher who denunciates these kind of things. And in fact, Uh, Just to impress all you high school students, if you want bonus points out there, uh, if you want to write down the word Jeremiah, Jeremiah comes from the word Jeremiah, and it means a woeful denunciation. Somebody that gets up on their soapbox and preaches and harangues and beats on people, that is a Jeremiah. (laughs) And what happened to dear Jeremiah, who was faithful to this tug from God, who came and delivered that kind of news? Well, what happened? He got put on a pole and lashed 40 times. He got completely scorned and mocked by the culture that was around him. They wanted to have rose-colored glasses. They wanted to think that everything was hunky-dory. And Jeremiah says... You are off the rails. And they didn't want to hear that. He was scorned. He was mocked. Not only that, as we read in Jeremiah, he was thrown down into a cistern, kind of left to drown there. He was then pulled out and sold into slavery, and he, frankly, died uh, in captivity. You know, if you're looking for uh, an uplifting story, uh, you know, kind of an uh, an American feel-good tale, Jeremiah is not where you go. <laughs> it isn't. Uh, you know, when you read Jeremiah as a reminder, God never promised you a rose garden, that there's going to be challenges. And here's the thing what Jeremiah does help us always be mindful of, is that, you know, it's not really the rose garden that we kind of think about, kind of trampling to the tulips. Instead, what it, the task in life is, is to honor our holy God and to keep faithful to that task. And in that great faithfulness, we will join with our Lord God in ultimate plan of salvation. But it's not always easy. It's not always, uh, you know, there are plenty of challenges that come up. Well, in the book of Jeremiah, we, we get this kind of um, cycle that is repeated several times within the scripture about how God tugs at us and what is our response to that tug. And and this was true of Jeremiah. It was also true of Isaiah. We're going to read about how it was true for some of the others. But I want to kind of reflect a little bit on this cycle. Again, if you got your thumb on uh, page 603, you're going to see this cycle. Here's the first. Verse 4. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, I consecrated you, I appointed you 
as a prophet. In other words, we have the kind of God, the God of the cosmos, who so intricately knows our lives that he will choose us for a task. He'll appoint us. Here is the truth. Our God selects us for a divine task. That's not only true of Jeremiah, it's true for everyone in this room. And our, of course, our goal is to find out precisely what that task is. But here's the selection. Here's then the next theme. Not only does God select, but we always object. And that's what happens with Jeremiah. Jeremiah says, I, I'm only a boy. I, I'm only a little kid. I don't know how to speak. I, I don't have any cred. I don't get any kind of uh, uh, accolades to put behind my speech. I'm only a boy. And so you got God's um, uh, selection. You have the human's objection. You then, as you go down a little bit more, you have that sense of the reassurance from the Lord that uh, uh, go to whom I send you uh, and you shall speak whatever I command you and do not be afraid of them for I am with you to deliver you. There is this promise of God's divine presence, says the Lord. So this cycle goes on, but then what is vital is that a sign is given to young Jeremiah. Uh, uh, It says here that the Lord put his hand on his uh, mouth and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, now I have my put my words in your mouth. You know, last week when we were looking at Isaiah, remember we had the tongue of fire? Uh, The tongs came down and touched Isaiah's lips. But here in Jeremiah, there's an actual, the Lord's hand reaching in and giving Jeremiah that which is what is to be offered. That is the sign that's to be given to him. And frankly, in this journey of life, we all need a sign. (laughs) Because, you know, when you have that moment, that tug of God, you've got to have that deep sense of feeling that God is for me. And, you know... Maybe that there are going to be times in the journey when you want to throw in the towel, that you just want to walk away from this faith. I mean, you prayed and prayed and prayed, and you didn't get what you wanted. You just want to give up on all that. And, you know, friends, how vital it is that we have a sense that God cares for us, God has a plan for us, and that we're part of God's grand plan of salvation. A sign shall be given. And Jeremiah receives that, and it helps him when he's going through all the challenges of being lashed and thrown into that well. Uh, He can reflect back to that day when he called on the Lord's name and was given that divine promise and that sign from his heavenly Father. Okay, uh, let's kind of wrap this up. First of all, what what is the word of the Lord that uh, Jeremiah was supposed to convey to God's people. Well, the first thing is that political regime change is coming. You people have gone off the rails. (laughs) Uh, You have uh, slipped into sexual sin of every way, shape, or form. You have uh, have committed injustice to the poor. You have been excessively greedy, and you have become so against one another that you've gone off the rails and that there is going to be a reckoning. That is the word of Jeremiah. And frankly, that's the word for all of us. Have we as a people gone off the rails completely? Have we so lost sight of that who we're intended to care for? Those who are in need, uh, our widows, the poor, Uh, the ones who are weak and disabled. If we've so lost sight of that, caught up in our own cycle of what can we get for us, that we've neglected God's righteousness, God's justice, God's mercy. I I think the word of Jeremiah is probably the word for us today, that, you know, your political loyalties always need to be secondary than to your loyalty to the Lord's Savior because the Lord is in his throne. And if we lose sight of that, friends, we've lost it all. If we become Americans first and Christians second, you're off the rails. I'm just telling you, you're off the rails. You always have to make Jesus Christ first and foremost. Everything else is secondary to that. Here's the second thing. 
Uh, the prophet, prophet Jeremiah is told, not only uh, he puts it in these words, he goes, uh, this is down, if you jump down to verse 16, I'm going to utter judgments against them for all their wickedness and forsaking me. They've made my offerings to other gods. That's the first thing. <laughs> Political regime change is coming. Second, uh, but you need to gird up your loins, stand up, and tell them everything that I command you. Gird your loins. It is an image of tighten up your belt, of getting prepared. Uh, it's really literally that girding your loins, you tuck your uh, uh, cloak into your waist because you're going to battle. And friends, in this journey where there's so much evil and uh, hurt all around us, brokenness everywhere, that we are in a battle, we're in a spiritual battle. And if you forget that, that is to your own <laughs> a threatened existence. We're in a battle. Gird up your loins, okay? That's what Jeremiah has been told, and that's what he conveys to others. Get prepared. Be ready for entering into spiritual battle for your very soul. Then finally, I think what we also hear from Jeremiah it actually comes later uh, in Jeremiah. This uh, is going to slip all the way uh, into uh, verse 33. You know, Jeremiah is often seen as a prophet of woe, of judgment, of somebody you don't want to invite to your party. I mean, he, all he does is lament. He's just kind of a, he's a party pooper in the best shape of the word. But you know, here is the reality. Jeremiah points ultimately to hope. In, throughout Jeremiah, there are these passages about uh, from this time of your desolation, a righteous branch will spring up from David and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. There is this righteous branch. There is this covenant of David that our holy God has promised, and that's your word of hope. You know, in the midst of all the woe and the judgment and the denunciation, here's the thing, that God's grace and God's mercy is still available. And ultimately, in God's grand salvation story, that this promise was fulfilled uh, to Jeremiah, that 600 years after Jeremiah made this pronouncement, about 550 years after the whole city of Jerusalem had been completely destroyed and all the people sent off in exile, over 500 years later, 600 years really, that a, the uh, promise of, was fulfilled when Jesus Christ came from this stump of Jesse, and gave us a new hope, a new promise of resurrection, of being part of God's salvation story. Okay, <laughs> where does this lead us? Well, friends, I, I think that at the point when the word comes, the word of the Lord comes to Jeremiah, that he had a choice. <laughs> you know, he could have run away. He could have said, I'm just a little boy. We all have excuses, don't you? Don't we? I'm too young. I'm too old. I'm too busy. Uh, I don't have the talents. I mean, I'm a pastor of a church. I get all the excuses under the planet, okay? I mean, why you don't come to worship? Why you aren't involved in small group? Why you aren't, why I can't, you know, why don't I give a witness? Oh, I can't do that, Pat. I get all the excuses. <laughs> you know, uh, you can always get an excuse. But perhaps maybe that's when, like Jeremiah, you take a deep breath. You stand up and you move forward to give a word of the Lord. And you know, I, I, we had the um, uh, For All the Saints celebration. I thought of all the people who I remember right where they sat. You know, Jeannie Gunn and, you know, uh, there was uh, Liz and uh, all those people. Where they all sat where you sat now. And they carried the torch for their season. And now maybe it's your time to carry your torch for the next season, and to pass that to the next generations. And my question is, are we going to be uh, willing just to give an excuse, I'm too old, I'm too young, I can't do it? Or instead, are we going to take the breath, stand up, and be the bearer of the word of the Lord? Let's pray. Almighty and gracious God, we give you thanks for uh, your promises given to us that when we turn to you, when you, you will give us the power 
to take a breath, to stand up and deliver your word. We need you, Lord Jesus, in a broken and challenging world. We ask your presence and peace this day. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.